Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Readings from scripture sacred to Jews and Christians from the prophet Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. 
It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from Scripture sacred to Christians from Paul's letter to the Philippians. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to Lord Christ. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? We have an interesting parable from Jesus this morning that at first pass seems to be about fairness or maybe economic justice or maybe it's about salvation or status in the church, a teaching that those who are newly come to faith are equal in the eyes of God with those who've been at this a long time. Jesus' way of saying, better late than never. But like any parable of Jesus, a closer look invites some questions. And one that I have is, where is the good news in this story? And who is it for? In my humble opinion. Parable explanations start to go off the rails when we try to make an allegory of them. That is, we imagine every character or thing in the story specifically represents some other person or thing. And of course, most people begin by identifying which person in the story is God. And surprise, surprise, nearly always, without ever questioning the assumption, Interpreters tell us that the wealthy and powerful man is God. But parables are not allegories. They are stories that make 
illuminating comparisons, and they are usually full of surprises. What happens to the meaning of this story if the landowner isn't God? What if these people are just people? The usual interpretation of the parable portrays the landowner as a benevolent fellow. He sees people with no gainful employment and decides to hire them. He is a job creator. Eh? But no businessman spends money he doesn't have to, right? What's up with only hiring them for the day? Well, of course, farm work is seasonal. Sometimes there's lots of work, and sometimes there's none at all. So this guy owns a vineyard, and apparently it's time for the harvest. So he needs help now that he doesn't need the rest of the year. So he gets up early in the morning and goes out to find some day laborers, which is kind of weird because we know he has an employee, a manager, not sure why the manager doesn't do the hiring, but anyway, the CEO himself goes downtown first thing in the morning and hires some temps. And then later he goes back and hires some more. And then later, some more, and then later, still more. And, you know, from a business perspective, this isn't making any sense. You, you don't hire people to be nice. You hire the people you need, and only the people you need, in order to keep costs down. So it could be that, actually, this guy isn't very smart. Th this guy thought he could get a whole harvest done in a day with four guys. Do it cheap. But as the day wears on, it's looking like it's not going to get done. And if you don't harvest the crops on time, they go bad and you lose money. So he keeps going back to the marketplace and each time bringing back just a few more guys. Every time he goes back, there are still people there. If he gives jobs to the needy, why didn't he just hire the whole crew in the morning? Why doesn't this guy know how to determine how many people he needs to get the job done? Anyway, so we get to the end of the day, and it's time to pay the workers. Now the landowner, he's the one who kept going out and finding people, but when the whistle blows, he has the manager pay them. Like, wouldn't you want to be the guy handing out the money? And the manager has been instructed to pay them in reverse order. The guys who got there last get paid first, but since they're all going to get the same pay, I can't figure out what difference the order makes, except it sounds like he is deliberately setting up the early birds to expect they're going to get more. And if the point of the parable is, wow, the landowner was so generous, I mean, they all got the usual daily wage, which is Bible speak for minimum wage. They get a denarius. This is not exactly a life-changing fortune. No, oh, maybe it's good pay for an hour's work for those last guys, but if they were going to get a whole denarius anyway, why didn't the guy just hire them all in the morning? And by the way, as of tomorrow, they're all unemployed again. Now, why are we so judgmental toward the first group who feel the compensation has been unfair? I mean, think about the auto workers' strike going on. Imagine if the car companies came back and said, okay, everybody gets a raise, but we're doing away with seniority and everybody will get the same pay no matter how long they've worked here. Or, We've come up with a new schedule. Some of you work 12 hours and some of you work one hour, and you all get 12 hours of minimum wage, and you have to reapply every day. I'm just going to go for that. And it seems like the moral of the story is the first will be last and the last will be first, 
which reminds us of the Magnificat, the Song of Mary. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. But the story isn't so much about reversal as it is about leveling, which is fine. There can be justice in that, too. Except here, it does not, in fact, feel just. And what you've got in the end is a bunch of tired guys who are all now equally poor. And another guy who presumably is going to make a profit from their labor. He is hardly sent empty away. And if this guy is God, and the story is about salvation, that no matter when we come to faith, the reward is the same. Is this how God operates? God goes out and finds people standing around and hires them for seasonal employment? Ah, maybe. Could be a really fascinating sermon on vocation in there. But if the point is God's generous grace that in the end we will all be treated the same, why is the illustration about people earning pay in exchange for labor? That is not what the church teaches about salvation. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? What if the guy in the story isn't God? What if it's just a story about regular folks? What if the takeaway is not, no matter how long or hard you've worked, we're all going to the same heaven? What if the point is to make you think about what you do with what you've got. This year's stewardship letters are on their way to you. <laughs> and I hope you will take some time to think about what you do with what you've got. As I say every year, stewardship is not fundraising. Stewardship is making right, good, and holy use of all that we have, which is more than money, it includes our very valuable time and our skills and expertise. In other words, what are you doing with your life? How much good can you do with what you have? Now, we here at Christ Church are in an unusual position. Thanks to your good stewardship, the generosity of generations before us, for the moment we have the resources to keep doing what we're doing. It's a world away from many churches who are really worried about whether they can keep going. But the question applies to churches as well as individuals. How much good can you do with what you got? I like to believe we're doing all we can with everything we have, which is precisely why we should give and give generously, not just to keep doing what we do. I look around Oberlin, and I see so much need. I also like to say, there are lots of ways to be hungry. And churches feed people in body, mind, and spirit. I absolutely believe people need what we have. The more we have, the bigger our obligation to help. You know, it's one thing to feed someone who is hungry now, as we do, five days a week, year round, and as we have for 40 years. That's amazing. But we give folks a meal, and tomorrow they'll be hungry again. 
Another thing about today's parable, at the end of the story, not a blessed thing has changed. It's one thing to meet a need. It's another to work to eliminate it. If today's parable is really about the kingdom of heaven, really about laborers in the vineyard, then let's not just work at doing the same thing over and over again, day after day. If the parable is really about fairness and justice and generosity, then let's work for meaningful change. Let's work for a world where there are no firsts and lasts. Let's ask ourselves every day, how much good can I do with all that I have? Amen. Please stand as you are able. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God of abundance, we praise you for the precious gift of your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that sacred mystery bearing witness always and everywhere to the eternal truths made known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to be good stewards of all you have entrusted to our hands, making right, good, and holy use of all that we possess, Lord of all. God of abundance, we praise you for Christ Church in Oberlin, for all this community of faith has done for us and for all we do for others. Set our hearts on fire with love for you and for each other. Make known your will for us and grant us grace and courage to accomplish it. We thank you for Bishop Ann, Father Andy, and Deacon Jane. We thank you for our staff and lay leaders, our cooks, musicians, and volunteers, and all who call Christ Church home, Lord of all. 
God of abundance in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we lift before you the Cuyahoga Mission area, especially St. Barnabas Bay Village, St. Thomas Berea, St. Matthews Brecksville, and St. Andrews Cleveland. And in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we ask your blessing upon the Church of Ireland. Provide for their every need and strengthen their hearts that the gospel may be truly preached and truly heard to the ends of the earth, Lord of all. Amen. God of abundance, we pray for this nation and for every nation and for those who have accepted the burdens of governing and caring for your people. Endow our leaders with wisdom, a zeal for justice and truth, a yearning for peace and respect for the dignity of every human being, Lord of all. We you. God of abundance, we praise you for this fragile earth, our island home, and all its marvels. Help us, Lord, to take responsibility for this precious, priceless treasure that every creature may live in safety, enjoying the fruits of your creation now and forevermore, Lord of all. God of abundance, healing, and mercy, look with compassion upon the sick and the suffering, the lonely and the frightened, the persecuted and the abused, and all who mourn. From our own parish family, we pray especially for Hank Annabel, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Beth Dorf, the Graves family, Scott Holcomb, Alan Husty, Louis and Kay Lossing, Sister Margaret Mack, Susan Matthias, Jay Marillo, Kathy Turner, and Karen Wolf. Entrusting them to your love, knowing you are already doing better things for them than we can ask or imagine, Lord of all. Amen. Who else needs our prayers? Lord of all, we thank you. God of abundance and source of all being, we praise you for the company of saints and all the faithful who have entered into your nearer presence, those who labored and are now at rest. We remember especially the very Reverend Roy Coulter, Virginia Schroeder, and Jack Haynes. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord of all. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Christ Church, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
You may be seated. Good morning, faithful. Welcome to Christ Church. I'm Father Andy. It is delightful to see you and so wonderful to have with us today our guest celebrant, Erica Plank Hagen, uh, who grew up in this parish and was ordained to the priesthood just this year mm -hmm. and at long last, the first time finally celebrating at the altar in this place. Welcome home, Erica. Uh, if you happen to be visiting today, there is a guest book on the welcome table as you come in or little cards in the pew racks with information about us. If you flip it over, you can leave some information about you uh, so that I can follow up with you about your visit to Christ Church. Following the service, I hope you can stay for fellowship and refreshment. We are back to lemonade on the lawn uh, because this week at long last, we had the upper level of the parish hall floor uh, refinished. Thank you. We can walk on it tomorrow. Uh, so we'll be outside for fellowship after the service. And by the way, then, if you need restrooms, please use the lower level of the parish hall. Uh, next Sunday, October 1st. Oh, my God, it's October. Oh, my God. Uh, next Sunday, October 1st, will be our St. Francis celebration with the blessing of the animals. So if you have a furry, feathered, four-footed, or scaly, well-behaved friend uh, that you can bring with you. You are welcome to bring your animals to church. If that's not going to work for you, bring a picture, and I will bless the picture. But next Sunday. Uh, this Wednesday, 7 p.m., lower level of the parish hall will be our last iteration for now of Episcopal 101. All are welcome. Uh, and we'll just be walking through the prayer book again. Uh, and if you have one of your own, bring it with you. We're going to talk about how to use this thing at, at home, what it can do for you. Uh, a save the date, Wednesday, October 25th. That's basically a month from now. Don't panic, Mary. Ah. Uh, the Oberlin Weekday Community Meals Annual Benefit Concert, Wednesday, October 25th, 7 p.m. at First Church. The reason I'm telling you this now is um, we're putting out a call for gift baskets for the raffle at the end of the concert. So if you feel like you might want to put together a gift basket, let us know. This afternoon at 4 o'clock at... Um, the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Roman Catholic Church in Lorraine, our very own Dr. Stephen Plank, will be leading the Consort of Cleveland Voices in a delightful concert. concert. That's four o'clock up in Lorraine. Uh, Sunday, October 8th at five o'clock, if you would identify yourself as a youth or young adult person, we're going to have a pizza party for you with our youth and young adult minister, Ben Holcomb. So that is Sunday, October 8th, 5 o'clock. Just come and uh, meet other people who are involved in the life of the parish here. Everything's free, of course. Um, yeah, and if you're thinking of coming, do let us know only so that we can appropriately uh, estimate the amount of pizza that we will need. Now I would like to call forward uh, Dave Giles to give this month's vestry report. Good morning. Uh, the vestry met this past Tuesday and uh, dealt with several items. Um, on foundation repair, Father Andy and Mike Hippler, our junior warden, have approved the foundation repair specifications with Osborne Engineering, and Osborne will begin a competitive bidding process among local contractors for the work that's got to be done. Um, and we should have bids by mid-October, so stay tuned. Um, on endowment matters, uh, based on the recommendations are, of our advisors at the Episcopal Church Foundation, the vestry has approved a 4% draw on the endowment for 2024. That doesn't mean that we met, mean to spend that entire amount but what is not needed for next year's operating budget then will be reinvested and tracked separately as cash that's available for future uses we need it. Um, for the Finance Commission, in accordance with the new policies that have been adopted this year, the vestry has appointed uh, three members to serve on our Finance and Endowment Com Commission. Uh, to, they'll serve staggered terms so the membership evolves on a rolling basis. Marta Giles has accepted a three-year appointment. Ross Peacock has accepted a two-year appointment and Jim Hausman one year. All members will be eligible to serve another term at the end of their terms. Um, the diocesan convention is coming up. Four members of our parish presented themselves to serve as delegates 
to this year's diocesan convention to be held on November 10th in Worcester. Um, the vestry appointed Ann Beach, Allison Richter, and me um, as this year's delegates with Mary McGill as the alternate. Um, for visioning, as part of our next steps in our strategic visioning process, Senior Warden Bob Follett has asked the members of the vestry to identify their top five priorities for the coming year and to categorize them with the community pillars that the parish identified last fall, which are worship and community and service. He also asked the vestry to reflect on our major accomplishments this past year and to think about them in terms of those pillars. Um, and as always, please do uh, get in touch with any of us on the vestry if you want to talk about more about anything that came up on this agenda or anything involving the parish. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Are there any other announcements from the community today? Any particular desires for special prayers for birthday, anniversary, travel, other needs? Travel. Yes. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, in particular Grover and Nina. Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger. Bring them in safety to their journey's end through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now I am going to turn it back to Reverend Erica for a special commissioning of officers of Daughters of the King. Calling all daughters. We are gathered here to install the elected officers of the Christ our Redeemer chapter of the Order of the Daughters of the King. In the presence of God and each other, let us hear covenant with him and with one another to do the things we believe he would have us do and try to do well whatever we attempt. Let us offer ourselves to him that he may continually work through us. Alison Ricker, President, and Don Yorko, Secretary Treasurer, you have been chosen by these, your friends, to serve in a position of responsibility. To you comes the call of leadership. Upon all rests the obligation of cooperation. Receiving now the responsibility placed upon you, will you agree to devote yourselves to the task that your office demands, continually seeking to be used by your Lord Jesus Christ? I will, with God's help. As members of the Order of the Daughters of the King, your duty this coming term is to cooperate with the officers you have chosen and to work together to fulfill the rules of prayer and service here in this chapter and beyond. We promise to pray for and support and cooperate with our officers, offering our best efforts to fulfill the mission of the order. We declare our loyalty to our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, to his church and its work, asking the Holy Spirit for guidance and strength in all that we undertake. May God richly bless you in all your efforts to the glory of his name for his sake. Amen. 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 Be seated. Dear ones, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacraments of the body of Christ and his blood of his new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints, 
we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear ones, life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always.